So please join me in welcoming Dr. John Tanner. Thank you, John. Thank you, Susan. It is such a treat to be here and to be a part of your health ministry. Thank you. I am glad that all of you guys are here tonight, gals and guys, and I'm glad to be here because I almost died. I almost died needlessly, and the question for you tonight is, will you die needlessly? We will all die at some point, but you can live your allotted years or you can cut it short your choice. I hope you'll make the choice, though, to not die needlessly. Tonight I'm going to talk about heart disease, cancer and diabetes, and uh, of course nutrition. I'll, I'll touch on protein and biomagnification, and we'll end with some steps toward health. My story starts about 13 years ago, when my wife turned to me and said, John, do you know that you have the body of a god? And we'd been married 20 years, and she'd never said anything remotely like that. So I said, really? I have the body of a god? She said, yes. Unfortunately, the god is Buddha. <laughs> Not exactly the physique to quest after, I would say. So um, in a desire to get rid of this uh, Buddha belly, I started exercising including I r running a mile every day. Here's my uh, running route. I would start at my home here. Uh, um, well, let's see, or not. My pointer just died. Uh, I would start at point C there, really at the beginning of my running route in Pasadena where I live. I'd run this uh, flag shape route and end up back home. I did that successfully for five years, almost every morning. And then on October 11, 2009, tomorrow will be my eight-year anniversary, I got to point B on my running route. I was running fine, and then I staggered a couple of steps and hit the ground unconscious with my heart stopped. That's how much warning you have of heart disease. You can't necessarily tell that you're sick. It's a disease of the inside of the arteries. You can't feel it, you can't see it, but you can be gone in a moment. You probably know that heart disease is the leading killer of men and women in this country. It's sometimes thought of as a man's disease, and at the younger ages, more men die of heart disease than women do, but at the older ages, more women die of heart disease than men. So by the time it's all over, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. In this country, heart disease is the single disease that you're most likely to die from. And it turns out sudden cardiac arrest, like I had, is the most common form of heart disease. You can have a heart attack where the heart doesn't stop completely. You can have angina where the heart is beating nor uh, more or less normally, but there's a lot of chest pain. But of those three, uh, cardiac arrest is the most common form. And if that should happen to you outside of the hospital, the survival rate is about 3%. So you take these three things together, and what that means is people are dropping dead all over this country suddenly. We hear about it in the news with uh, public uh, figures, but sadly many of us in this room have had friends, colleagues, family members that one day they seemed okay and the next day they're gone. So uh, by the first two of these, leading killer and leading form, what happened to me is not unusual at all. The fact that I survived is a little unusual, 3%. And that's part of why I feel I need to tell the story here, because 97% of the people that had happened to them, what happened to me, aren't around to tell about it. This is uh, what the doctor saw when he got me to the, they got me to the hospital, rushed me through the ER up to the cardiac catheter lab. They cut an incision on the inside of my leg, pushed a small plastic tube called a catheter up the blood, big blood vessel, round the aorta, and into the heart, which is shown here. You can see one of my ribs there. You can see the end of the plastic tube. And just before this video starts, the doctor pushes a foot pedal, which squirts a uh, dark dye into the tube, which uh, comes out. And as you see this video, I want each of you to see if you can figure out where my problem was. Does everybody think they see the problem? Are you maybe looking right there? 
Now it looks like from this frame of the image that uh, there's no blood getting by this blockage, but clearly there is some or else we wouldn't see the dye uh, downstream from there. But you can tell that even though there's some blood getting through there, not very much. And that was my problem. And after quite a number of weeks and months of studying heart disease and its causes, I was forced to come to the conclusion that I did this to myself. And the vast majority of Americans are in the process of doing that, this to themselves. I might even go so far as to say that a number of people in this room are in the process of doing this to themselves. But you don't have to. One of the uh, points of information that I found was a gentleman by the name of Caldwell Esselstyn. He wrote a book called Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. You're going to get a coupon later on tonight that uh, will allow you to choose one of eight books or a DVD. Uh, there are samples of all of them out on the table, uh, closest to the wall just outside. This is one of your choices. So if you'd like to leave here tonight, go to the website, use the coupon, I'll send you this book. But if you don't happen to do that or have the time to read it, I'll share uh, just a few of the key points from this book. The, this author, this doctor, this researcher says, nearly half the people in, this, in the US will suffer heart disease needlessly. And he says, know your cholesterol levels, total cholesterol and LDL. Don't count on your doctor's interpretation of these numbers. Know them yourself. And your total should be below 150, and your LDL should be below 80. And if the, that applies to you, your numbers are lower than that, and you're not on any treatment, you're not going to have a heart attack. And congratulations. But for the vast majority of us in this country, our numbers are above those numbers. And if that's the case for you, read the book and fix the problem yourself. This doctor says doctors cannot fix heart disease. Let me repeat that. This doctor says doctors cannot fix heart disease, but you can fix it yourself. But doctors will try to fix it. They're, they'll give you medications, statin drugs. They go by names of uh, Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, those sorts of things. Turns out they don't work very well and they have harmful side effects. I'll talk about both of those in just a moment. They, they uh, will put in stents, as metal mesh tubes that they insert into the blood vessel and expand to try to open up the blockages. Turns out they don't cure heart disease. The problem wasn't caused by your lack of stent. The cause was something else. The next thing they'll want to do is a coronary artery bypass graft, sometimes called cabbage or just bypass surgery. We do half a million a year of those massive surgeries. Well, they don't cure heart disease. They're not addressing the root cause. We spend 10 billion a year on the drugs alone, and by the time we add stents and bypasses, we spend 50 billion that's not million, that's billion with a B in this country. $50 billion on these interventions that don't cure heart disease. But diet can prevent and reverse heart disease. I believe that uh, the dis disease level has gotten to this point in this country because we don't associate what we put in our mouth with what happens inside our body. So I have a couple of little video clips here I want to share that start to give you a hint as to the relationship between what you put in your mouth and what goes on inside your body. Now the first of these, uh, the doctor is going to talk about these two blood samples in front of him. Uh, they were given by two different patients. Typically you, you're told uh, when you give a blood sample, don't eat anything for 10 or 12 hours beforehand. And you may not know why, shortly you will. But after you give the blood sample, they let it set for a while so it separates into its component parts so they can see each of them, those parts individually. The patient who gave the, the sample on your left adhered to the rule about not eating. The patient on, who gave the sample on the right, not so much. Now normally this liquid layer floating on top of the blood clot is quite transparent. It's yellow but quite clear, you can see right through it. The blood in this patient's tube, however, was anything but clear. 
The serum floating on his bond was thick and greasy white. He looked like blue. In fact, it stuck to the sides of the blood tube when I shook the tube. I went back to the patient. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital tonight? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized that what I was looking at in his tube was all the fat in the beef burger, all the butter fat in the cheese, and the butter fat in the ice cream, and the milkshake. Now here's the great news. If at some time in your life you've had a cheeseburger and a milkshake, <laughs> not to worry. Your body is awesome. It clears this stuff away. How long does it take? 10 or 12 hours. That's why they tell you don't eat anything before your blood test because they want to see your blood the way it's supposed to be, not the way you've messed it up by what you just ate. But what do most Americans do before our bodies have had a chance to clear away this gooey stuff because of what we ate? We eat again. And so most Americans are bathing the insides of their arteries with this gluey, sticky stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But don't worry, your body is awesome. It can clear that away constantly, constantly, um, but not forever and not perfectly. For me, it took 52 years. I don't know how long it will take before your uh, body can't keep up and you're in trouble. But let's uh, take a look at the long-term effects. Now, we don't know for sure that this patient, what his normal diet was, but we might guess that this wasn't his first cheeseburger and milkshake. So, so let's, uh, let's take a look at the long-term effects of uh, uh, abusing the insides of our arteries. The next morning, we took Mr. Phillips to the operating room, and I put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest. And from these arteries, he began pulling out yellow, greasy deposits of fatty material called atherosclerosis. Keep that in mind now. <laughs> Cheeseburger, milkshake, this is what you're doing to yourself. You need to understand, too, that this roto-rooter job that he's getting here isn't fixing him. It's actually making him worse. They don't do this surgery anymore because it's stripping out the inner lining of his uh, arteries. So surgery is not a solution to this problem caused by what you eat. I want to talk about cholesterol blood tests for a moment. Uh, cholesterol in the blood is not the cause of death. In fact, a certain amount of cholesterol in the blood is natural. Our liver produces it. So there's that amount of cholesterol that's supposed to be there, and then there's the amount of cholesterol in your blood because of the animal products you ate. Almost all animal products have cholesterol in them. No plant products have cholesterol. So what's floating in your blood it comes from the animal products you ate plus the liver-produced cholesterol is supposed to be there. Even then, the, the level at the moment isn't what causes you to drop dead. It's the level that is elevated over a long period of time and some of it works its way underneath the first layer of cells and builds up deposits behind. That's what gets you. But they have found, scientists have found, it's a good indicator of the likelihood of death when they take blood out of you and measure the cholesterol because chances are if that's high because of the, the animal products you ate, it's likely to, that it was also high yesterday and last week and last month and last year, and there's probably a, a, a buildup that happens because of that, and you're, you're likely to die because of that buildup. The Framingham Heart Study was a study that found, established the correlation between that blood test measurement and the chances of death due to heart attack. And it turns out that under most conditions, this marker is an effective diagnostic tool. That means know the number, and that tell, gives you a pretty good indication about whether you're really safe or you're about to drop dead. But there's one exception to that as a good marker. Uh, in June 2010, there was a published study that showed that the statin drugs, Lipitor, Zocor, Crestor, they break the correlation. What does that mean? It means that the uh, cholesterol blood tests go down, but you still die nearly as often. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about the, the numerical values there in just a moment. But I, I liken this to uh, when you're driving your car and the check engine light comes on. You understand that this red light streaming into the passenger compartment 
is not the problem. It's an indicator that there's a problem somewhere else. But based on that indicator, you take action. You take your car into the mechanic. He does something, and uh, uh, the next day you pick up your car and the check engine light is off. And you think, yay, the mechanic fixed the problem. But if you then happen to look under your dashboard and you saw the wires that ran to the red light and they looked like this, <laughs> you would say that, in fact, the mechanic didn't fix the problem. He just disabled the indicator. And that's what it's like when you're taking statin drugs. And just like you wouldn't, shouldn't be fooled by this uh, unscrupulous mechanic, don't be fooled by the statin drugs. So why do we take these drugs if they don't really do us much good? Well, what do they do exactly? They inhibit the liver's natural production of cholesterol. That is, they are liver toxins, liver poisons that you're intentionally asked to put into your body to keep your liver from doing what it's supposed to do while it does nothing about the cholesterol that got into your bloodstream from the animal products you ate. So when you understand it like that, maybe it's not so much a surprise that these drugs don't really have much of an effect on increasing longevity, and they have some side effects. The biggest one, guess what? Liver damage. Not a surprise. You're taking liver poisons. You get liver damage. Muscle soreness is a big problem, and a set of symptoms that seem a lot like Alzheimer's. And uh, a lot of people are misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's because they have short-term memory loss, uh, concentration loss. They take them off the statin drugs, and their cognitive powers come back. So it wasn't Alzheimer's at all in, in many cases. Now, I'm, this looks like a really smart room, and I bet a lot of you can spare some brain cells. But I need all of mine working. I'm sorry. So this is the most scary thing for me. And I was on these drugs for a year. The damage, the brain damage, is dose and duration dependent. That is, the higher the dosage of statins you're on, the worse the brain damage is going to be. And the longer you're on those drugs, the worse it's going to be. So the sooner you can get off of them, or at least reduce the dosage, the better off you'll be. Now, what are the numbers? Well, if you get your blood test back from Kaiser, like I do, uh, the, the, your, your reading comes back, says, this is your number, and here's the standard number. And it says the standard number for total cholesterol is 200. The study showed that it should be below 150. So what is this 200? Well, it turns out it's the American Heart Association's determination of about the average of the total cholesterol of all Americans in this country. This is an average reading among a group of people whose leading cause of death is heart disease. <laughs> you do not want to be average. You want to be healthy. So don't believe that 200 is OK, and don't count on your doctor to know that uh, 200 is too high. The Framingham Heart Study found that a third of all uh, people with heart disease had cholesterol between 150 and 200. So certainly it's better to be below 200 than above, to be in the one-third instead of the two-thirds. But that doesn't mean you're healthy. And in fact, I'm a great example of that. My last uh, cholesterol blood test before my cardiac arrest, I was 188. So doctors that think 200 is OK, I beg to differ. No, 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 the statins came after my heart attack. I was on no medication before my cardiac arrest. So here's the uh, numerical part of this uh, presentation. And, and let me just say a few words about what this is. So uh, this is not one big study that compared five different treatments of heart disease. This is five different studies. And the thing that allows me to put them all in the same graph is each of them had a control group, which is, the treatment versus no treatment. So the no treatment I've put up there in the far left is the baseline for all five of these studies. So let's uh, go through them one at a time. The first of these uh, come, came from Duke University, where for years, as uh, they were, had the capability of doing stents, they had patients that would come into their um, medical facility as candidates for stents, and they would arbitrarily pick half of them to get the stent and half not get the stent. And then they'd track these patients for years afterwards so they could determine statistically how many in each group lived and died. 
And uh, the, in 2004, they had enough data to publish. And they, the, the study had two key numbers that I took out of it. One is, what is the death rate for the people who are candidates for stents but didn't get the stent? The death rate is expressed as number of deaths per 100,000 patients per year. I took that number and applied a scaling to it so it, uh, it would be 100%, and it represents this baseline bar that you see. I applied the same scaling on the graph to the other number in this study, which is what is the death rate for the people who got the stents? And if stent is a highly effective treatment, you'd expect this bar to be a lot lower, a lot fewer people to die. Here it is. 97% of the people who would have died still die even though they get the stent. I don't know about you, but I don't consider that a very effective treatment. The next one is a, a, a pharmaceutical company funded study, and of course we believe that, but, <laughs> but, but in this case it's probably a, an okay uh, study to believe. Well, in this case what they did is they took a whole bunch of patients that were, had high cholesterol and they broke them into two groups. Half of them they gave statin drugs to and half that didn't get the drugs. And for this study, what they were interested in is not death rate, but did it drop the cholesterol measurement in the blood? And so the group who uh, didn't get the statin drugs, their uh, cholesterol level basically stayed the same, and I've scaled that to be the baseline 100%. The group that did get the statin drugs, way down, 85% down. Ladies and gentlemen, statin drugs work. They work to lower the blood test measurement. Do we care about the blood test measurement? Only to the extent that it reflects risk of, of dying of heart disease. So let's look directly at that number. Now this next bar, this comes from the June 2010 study that I mentioned, 65,000 patients all candidates for cholesterol lowering medications because they all had high cholesterol. Half of them got the statins, half of them didn't. But in this case, we're looking not at the blood test, but actual death. So out of that study came two numbers, the death rate for the control group that didn't get the drugs, and I've scaled that to be 100%. And then I applied the same scaling to the number, the death rate for the ones who did get the statin drugs. And again, if the statins were effective, you'd expect this to be a lot lower. Here it is, 91%. Now, I can't stand up here and say statins have no benefit, although the author of this study stated that very clearly. He said within the error bounds of this study, they cannot conclude that there's any benefit to statin drugs. But let me just give them the statistical benefit of the doubt and say the most likely situation is 9% uh, deaths reduced. Not terribly impressive in my opinion. And the sad thing about this is these drugs are held out as solving your problem, so much so that you may not be encouraged to look elsewhere for things that might be better. Well, this next study came from the UK they asked people what they ate. Most of them eat like we do here, a lot of animal products, uh, but some fraction of them don't eat any meat. So they tracked their death rate for years afterwards. Again, I scaled the, the regular uh, Western diet eaters to 100% and the vegetarians. Their death rate was this. Now, it's not, uh, there's still a lot of red there, still a lot of death due to heart disease among vegetarians. But if you look not at the height of the red bar, but the white above it, the gap from 100% down, you can see that it's three times more effective to be vegetarian than it is to take statin drugs. So why aren't the doctors out there saying, well, we could give you the statin drugs and they might give you small benefit uh, with a lot of side effects, or you could be a vegetarian and get three times the benefit without the side effects. And a few doctors are saying that, but not enough. But there's one more study that I want to talk about, and this comes from Dr. Esselstyn, who I mentioned before. Um, he took 200 patients, he and some other researchers, and they asked each of them to eat this ideal diet. And I'll talk in a moment about what that is. You probably have a good guess already uh, after hearing uh, what Susan had to say. But um, he, he asked these 200 patients to eat, go on this ideal diet. 90% said, sure, doc, I'm in. I'm going to give this a go. And 10% said, no thanks. 
Okay, we'll track them all. That gives us a control group. So the 10% who didn't and the 90% who did, they look not just at deaths due to heart disease, but four other types of cardiac events, heart attack that didn't lead to, lead to death, angina, stent emplacement, and uh, bypass surgery. So they tallied up all kinds, all these five types of coronary events for the group of, of people who didn't change their diet, and I've scaled that number to 100% on this uh, chart. I've applied the same scaling to the cardiac event rate for those patients per year uh, for the ones who switch the ideal diet. And before I show you the height of this bar, I want you to each think to yourself, how low does that bar need to go before it's meaningful to each of you? I think you'll all agree that it has to go below the vegetarian bar, or else we'll just do that. How low? Here it is. 0.5%. Is anybody else astonished by that number? Cardiac disease goes away on the ideal diet. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Here's some evidence of it. This is a gentleman who had not just one raggedy spot in his left anterior descending artery like I had, but he has a whole length of raggedy artery. Two and a half years later, you can see uh, that picture of that same artery disease reversed, just on a plant-based diet. Awesome, the ideal diet. Okay, what is the ideal diet? Well, here, we'll start with the bad things. You knew this. This is red meat. We've known that for decades. Not good for you. But what you may not know is that pork, chicken, and fish are equally bad. Turns out animal protein and animal fat individually are both pretty bad for a whole host of organs and uh, causes a lot of disease. But the two of them together, animal protein and animal fat, the perfect storm to ravage us. Fish has a special problem I'll get to in just a moment. Even worse than meats, dairy. Milk, cheese, butter, ice cream. Eggs, they also have animal protein, animal fat. Processed foods, I put the donut in as a placeholder for a whole host of manufactured foods. And I'm sorry to say, vegetable oil is not healthy either. Now, I'm not saying you should never eat any of these things, but I'm saying the science is really, really clear. If you eat these things on a regular basis, they're most likely going to lead to heart disease or other preventable disease and you in the casket before your time. Or you could choose to eat a whole host of healthy, colorful vegetables, emphasis on leafy greens, fruits in moderation, beans are awesome, whole grains including corn, oatmeal, brown rice please, better than white, whole wheat, better than white. Potatoes are awesome nutritionally. The problem with potatoes is the company they keep you, you cook them in oil, they become unhealthy. You bake them and put cheese or sour cream or butter on them, they become unhealthy. But the potato is great. Even better are sweet potatoes. They are so awesome nutritionally. There are societies on this planet that eat nothing but sweet potatoes. They have no heart disease, no colon cancer. I'm not saying that you should only eat these foods, but if you should choose to do so, the science is really, really clear. What's likely to happen to you is 20 more years of life, perhaps instead of just seeing your kids grow up, you get to see your grandkids grow up, that would be awesome. But you put the photo there that is most meaningful to you, and the closest you'll come to the gravestones are when you run by and see the people who ate the things on the previous slide. The, the researchers don't tend to not call this a vegan diet because, after all, uh, vegan isn't necessarily healthy. Oreo cookies and Coca-Cola are vegan, not healthy. So they call it, the researchers call this a low-fat, whole-plant diet. This is just the textual form of the pictures you saw. It consists of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and legumes, no meat or fish, no eggs or dairy, no oils, no added oils, including olive oil, no processed foods, and you really, the low fat comes in that you really want less than 10% of your calories from fat. Now, you could carefully measure and keep track of all the fat calories you ate throughout the day, 
but most of the fat in the American diet comes from animal products, and those who have given up animal products, there's, it's oils and just a few other things. And if you limit or avoid those completely, and I'm talking about nuts and seeds, coconut and avocados, then you don't have to pay any attention to how much fat you're eating. Now, totally healthy people can have a little bit of nuts, coconut, and avocado, but if you're trying to lose weight and fight off diseases that you already have, it would be better to leave all of those. And be cautious with soy and fruit juice. The whole soy, including uh, tempeh, uh, edamame, and tofu are fine, but as Susan said, the heavily processed fake meat, soy, textured vegetable protein, you want to get past that phase as soon as you can and start avoiding that. And fruit juice uh, is, uh, leads to high sugar surges and high insulin surge that follows that. So there, fruit juice is not a lot more healthy than Coca-Cola. So if you think you're doing yourself a favor by switching from soda to fruit juice, as Susan says, better to just switch to water. Here's what Esselstyn says about this diet. People sometimes think that this diet that I just described is extreme. And he says this, some people think whole food plant-based diet is extreme. Half a million people a year will have their chests opened up and a vein taken from their leg and sewn onto their coronary artery. Some people would call that extreme. So in that context of this major surgery, maybe eating a vegetable isn't so extreme. Here's what the um, uh, president of the American College of Cardiology says. There are two types of cardiologists, vegans and those who haven't read the data. <laughs> Switch uh, briefly to talk about cancer. It's the second biggest killer in the US. Sorry, most of us probably have cancerous cells in us right now. Most of them don't grow very large because our body has defense mechanisms. But occasionally one of them gets by those defense mechanisms and grows 20, 30 years, and then it's a problem for us. With consistent diet, uh, the doubling rate remains constant, but we can affect that growth rate through our choice of what to eat. And uh, with diet, many, but not all lives can be saved. It's not quite as dramatic as it was for heart disease, but it's still very, very significant. Here's some of the data that uh, connects uh, what we eat with uh, uh, various cancers. Here you can see the, the countries that ha eat more animal fat tend to have more breast cancer. This one, uh, those who eat more meat total have more colon cancer. And here's a lab study that uh, illuminates a particular uh, component of food. In this case, they uh, took these lab rats, two groups of them, injected them with aflatoxin, which causes liver uh, cancer. And they gave one group a standard mouse diet and included about 5% milk protein, and they all lived. The other group got 20% milk protein, and they all died. And the author uh, of the China study comments that this 20% is something that we could easily see in our daily life. If you have dairy milk on your breakfast cereal, you have a cheeseburger for lunch and ice cream for dinner, you're kind of in this range. Let's not go there. Here's what this researcher says. Casein, the main protein of cow's milk, is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. So does milk do a body good? No, it does the cancer good. Let's not fuel our cancers. Uh, cow's milk also contributes to type 1 diabetes. You can see a correlation plot here. Type 2 diabetes has a similar name, but a very different disease. It's not caused by eating carbohydrates, as some think. Uh, in fact, in the 50s, doctors were reversing type 2 diabetes with a diet of only white rice and fruit juice, which if you believe carbs were the problem, that would be the wrong diet, but it served to re reverse type 2 diabetes. It's the fat that you eat, and so you can uh, adjust that fat intake and uh, get rid of type 2 diabetes. If you don't, it's a progressive disease. It generally gets worse despite the best medications that we have. And it uh, ultimately results in amputations, blindness, and painful death. Here's uh, somebody's uh, diabetic gangrenous heel on their foot. Shortly after this picture was taken, the patient uh, had to have their foot amputated. 
You can uh, attack this with American Diabetes Association diet that slows it down, but doesn't typically cure it. But this ideal diet is three times better as measured by A1C measurements. And the cure usually happens within two to four weeks. This is what Dean Ornish, a pioneer in this area, says. Think about it. Heart disease and diabetes are completely preventable by making comprehensive lifestyle changes without drugs or surgery. If you take the Center for Disease Control's top 15 causes of death and you group them according to which ones are caused by our food choices, you get this. Two-thirds of the deaths in this country, this is 1.2, 1.3 million Americans every year die because of our food choices. Think about that. You and two of your closest loved ones, if the three of you insist on eating a standard American diet, statistically, two out of three of you are going to die needlessly. Let's not. So the right diet can prevent, reduce all of these diseases, and the great news is it's the same diet. If we had to choose between an anti-heart disease diet and an anti-cancer diet, that would be a tough choice, but we don't. It's the same diet. So people will ask you when you're on a plant-based diet, where do you get your protein? Here's the answer. First, uh, it's important to think of protein uh, needs not in terms of grams per day, but as a percentage of our total calories. Because when you look at it that way, it's independent of how large you are and how active you are. So that's the way to think of it. What percentage of your calories need to be protein? And depending on the study, the answer it comes uh, along that, uh, the scale along the top in the, that gray bar, somewhere between 2.7 and 4%. That's how much protein you need. Uh, if you look at a variety of foods, you'll see that fruits don't have a lot of protein. Apples are a little shy, but bananas have enough. Oranges and strawberries more than enough. If we looked at foods that we think of as starches, potatoes, corn, rice, oatmeal, wheat, quinoa, they all have way more protein than you need. If you look at vegetables, uh, carrots are not real high, but more than the minimum. Broccoli and spinach are nearly off the chart there. And of course, peas, beans, and lentils have lots of protein. So if you look at this graph, the question is, what on here can you eat in any combination that will provide your minimum protein needs? And the answer is almost everything, not quite apples, almost everything. Biomagnification has to do with toxins. Here's, here's a little patch of uh, pasture land and a little tiny dot of toxin that I've shown as a little black dot. It's right there if you can't see it. Along comes the cow and eats that patch of grass and the little toxin. And over its lifetime, this toxin builds up inside the cow, so by the time it gets to your plate in the form of meat or dairy, it's multiplied maybe 100 to 1,000 times. So what the cow could ignore safely as a low level, you may not be able to ignore because it's way higher in what you're eating when you eat the cow's meat or dairy. In the ocean, same sort of thing. There's a little uh, toxin that gets taken up by the algae. Along come the krill or little fish, and they eat that, and through their lifetime, they build up to 100 to 1,000 times. Then along come the salmon or the tuna and eat the little fish. They build up toxins to a level of 100 to 1,000 times what's in their diet, which is the little fish, which also already is 100 to 1,000 times what's in the water. So by the time it gets to your plate in the form of fish food, the toxins are so much that I can't fit them all on the slide here. I have to reduce the size of the slide like this so that you can see all the toxins. And that's mid-range. To go to the higher end of the range, which, this is like 100,000, the higher end of the range would be a million times. I'd have to shrink it like this. But a million times might not be enough. There's one report out there that shows not a million times, but in salmon, nine million times the toxin level that the water it's swimming in. So to show you that much, I'd have to do this. So the question is not whether you'll get some toxins with your fish. The question is, will you get some fish with your toxins? And then I found out that a third of the fish catch, the commercial fish, fish catch, doesn't go to serving humans, it goes to feeding livestock. So we're taking this 
highly magnified stuff and running it through one more level of magnification in the cows and chickens and, and pigs that you eat. How do we avoid this? Eat plants. Um, I've, uh, if, can we hand out the uh, coupons now? You're, you're going to get this little packet that consists of a brochure from my nonprofit organization, NUSI, the Nutrition Science Foundation. Uh, it gives you the website. I've shown it here as well. It's uh, newsci.org. Uh, and on that website, you'll, you'll find a number of things. Along the far uh, right column, there's notifications of our workshops. In Monrovia, which is just a little bit east of Pasadena, once or twice a month, we do three-hour evening workshops where I go in much more depth than I am tonight, and we give you a free meal, all, all at no cost. Just uh, there's instructions on the website for how you RSVP. We'd love to see you up there. On the website also, you'll, see, you'll find recipes, a doctor's directory, some success stories if you need some motivational material, and if you'd like to help us through a financial donation, we would love that as well. Uh, also in the packet you're going to get is uh, a coupon. Looks like this, with the one with the red border on it. If you look, this coupon is good for one free book or DVD that I will give to you. Uh, the choices are there in the back. If you, there's samples of each of these books out in the back. Again, please don't take them because I only have one copy here tonight. But take this coupon to our website. Choose what book you want. Give us your address. We'll mail it to you. If you've been to one of my events before and you've gotten one of these coupons already, you're welcome to have another one. But what might, might be even better is you've, you take this coupon and give it to a loved one or a coworker and see if you can draw them into this, learning more about this. My nonprofit organization is, in addition to the website, I'll uh, give talks wherever. If you're in a company or an organization that would like me to come in and talk to a group of uh, employees, I would love to do that. I'll give public talks to middle schools, high schools, Kiwanis Club, Rotary, churches, anybody who will listen, sign me up. And of course, we do workshops and affiliate events uh, in, in our office in Monrovia. Uh, these are the books that, uh, well, this, you can get this DVD, Forks Over Knives, which is awesome. It's also available on Netflix if you have Netflix. The China Study is, is a wonderful book, as is Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. John McDougall's Starch Solution, Neil Bernard's Di Diabetes Book, Whitewash, all about dairy. Mad Cowboy, if you want to know more about the meat industry, that'll scare you. Uh, if you want to lose weight, The Plant Advantage, and if you just need a, a cookbook, Better Than Vegan is a very nice one. And I'd like to introduce uh, Tanner Care, Tanner Care Health and Wellness Center, a new organization that we created a little over a year ago dedicated to the prevention and reversal of diseases, primarily through nutrition education. We put together, for those who need more than just an evening talk, uh, we, we put together 62-hour uh, and 75-hour year-long programs that involve a lot of group support, people that are going through this behavioral change, do it, doing it together, struggling with, you know, how do I eat only plants and avoid that nasty animal products. We include mobility and strength training and lots and lots of nutrition education, what to eat, what not to eat, uh, units on various things and one-on-one -on -one access to our professional staff, depending on which program you're in. Here's our, our staff at the moment, uh, doctor, nurse, two nutritionists. In the uh, lower left corner is Molly Groupie, who's going to be uh, sh sharing our, our uh, cooking demo shortly. Uh, you, if you are in any of our programs, you would definitely get to see her on a regular basis. Our first, first cohort started almost a year ago, so we're just finishing that up. In the first eight weeks, we, the group averaged almost a pound a week in weight loss, and it kept going throughout the year. Uh, they averaged 20 points of blood pressure drop in that first two months, and significant improvement in, as you would imagine, cholesterol, LDL, uh, blood sugar dropped, a whole bunch of things that we weren't necessarily expecting. Uh, mobility improved, energy improved, sleep improved, less pain. Uh, I actually uh, was in, uh, joined this cohort myself, and in seven years on my own, I was able to lose 40 pounds, 
And in this last year in this program, I lost another 20. So I have to tell you, this is not all positive. I now have a closet full of clothes that look like this. <laughs> Does anybody think that I should get a new suit? Okay. So a thought to leave you with. When I see a cheeseburger, I look at that and I lust after it. I'm sorry, after eight years of not eating this, it still appeals to me. Why do I not eat it? Because I know it's gonna to lead to illness and death, and I may have something in my life worth more than the temporary joy of eating that cheeseburger. What could that be? I have something in my life that's worth the biggest pile of cheeseburgers you could ever imagine. My family. And the thought I'd like to leave you with tonight is, what do you have in your life? Fill in this question mark, question mark in the box here. What do you have in your life that's worth more to you than that temporary joy of eating that cheeseburger. Thank you.